you in a good position to uh, get some testing underway within uh, your, uh, your own projects, okay? Um, uh, I haven't had a chance to come in and, and check AV issues, and um, I'm hoping that this issue has been resolved. I was hoping to be here as well with a different machine. Um, oh, wow, that's, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, this is not a, this is not a like lunch of a dance party or something. Um, that is, um, Okay, I, I sometimes go through slides a bit quick, but this is kind of overdoing it, right? Um, but if maybe if you blink at 60 hertz, you'll... Um, yeah, this is... Um, wow, okay, well, um, we have our uh, fallback again. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to field... Um, uh, ideas from um, the uh, the case uh, that you did for uh, further thinking on. Um, what are some further tests you came up with um, when thinking about that problem on your own? Anyone? Yeah, Mason. Okay, good. So needing to be uh, aware of capitalization. Um, uh, conformance of, of the correctness of the results. In other words, um, you want to make sure that it's not equating things that uh, different, differ in their capitalization. It's not thinking lowercase a is the same as uppercase a, right? Um, which could happen in certain environments by using reg exp options, which are case insensitive, for example. Um, so that opens up a class of tests, you know, that, that have to do with uh, not recognizing lowercase for uppercase and vice versa. Um, so so I, I welcome that. Other, other ideas people might have come up with? Camille, yeah. Uh, if you search for an empty string. Mm. Yeah, so, so that's a, a whole class of them. And, and once again, that is something which, um, you know, brings up issues like, what should the correct behavior be, right? Um, because uh, we want it to conform with the specification, but the specification that was given deliberately did not include um, a specification of what if we search for, for empty string. There's no explicit attention to that. It, it said, you know, repeat the number of times that you know, string B occurred in string A, but it's not really well defined the number of times that string B is empty, right? Um, does it occur zero times, one time, 10 times? Well, it's, it's pretty much all the same in terms of its implications. So what should it return? Um, this is an important question. So, so that's a, a really good example and also, searching in things that are empty themselves. So in strings that are empty, right? Searching for the empty string, but searching in, in strings, uh, looking for it in strings that are empty, make sure that there's no, there's no bug there. Um, there's no problem. That one's well defined from the specification standpoint, but it's not, um, it's not necessarily mean that its implementation is correct. So often we distinguish again, um, you know, the design and the implementation. And, you know, there's a question of when the design is misunderstood or it's not explicit enough. That's the, the spec as given by the specification. And, and then on the other hand, there may be problems with implementation. So all those are things you're looking for in coming up with tests. It often pushes us to specify things more precisely. How about other ideas? Anyone come up with some neat ideas? Yeah. Uh, what if we have special characters in string like Exactly. Yeah, so, so certain types of special characters. Give me a couple examples of special characters. Like 
backslash. Uh, good. Good. Backslash uh, would be one of them. Um, uh, does it does it correctly interpret that as a literal character, or does it instead, um, you know, interpret that as something which is uh, instead, uh, you know, uh, an escape character, right? It, inter it doesn't interpret it literally as it should, right? Um, others, yeah, Sam. Good. So, like, <clears throat> um, is it searching for them literally in terms of finding the tab character, or might it match a set of spaces as tabs, right? Or does it, if you search for a space, does it match a tab, right? Um, uh, those are that indeed is opens up some interesting ones. Others, yeah, Mason. Well, I mean, yeah. Good, yeah, so things that are symbols or things that are in, you know, uh, aren't expressible in ASCII in the lower seven bits. Um, uh, well, even more specifically, it's not in whatever, 32 through 104 or whatever, the, 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 the characters with the number, alphanumerics um, in them, but is outside that range. This could include Unicode uh, characters that are often encoded in Unicode from other languages, right? Um, so, uh, so good. Will? You can have like A backslash N and then A and see if it interprets the, the new line character as basically the end of trunk like, everything after the new line. I love it. I love it. Yeah, so you're looking for a, a string to see how does it parse, does it parse it as kind of lines? Um, that are breaking up something. Can you look for that as, as a sequence of characters? Uh, it kind of builds on the escape character idea, but um, takes, it, takes it further and kind of intelligently looking for chunks that would indicate does it, how does it match it? So I, I, I like that idea, Matt. You could try it with path or system variables, see if there's Yeah, I like it. So path and system variables is it shoving in sort of some some system variables uh, uh, in there, expanding them into things that weren't intended. It was intended as a literal string, but it interprets more. Yeah, uh, Mesa. As in, let's say, uh, uh, any language or system implementation of uh, EBSCO characters in there, and see what happens. Yeah, OK. Um, Good, good. So maybe if there's a transpiler or compiler, you compile down in one and it runs on another, is it doing the correct thing? You're cross compiling it over or something and is it going to do it properly on the target system? So I love it, yeah, Evan. Yeah, yeah, so for security concerns have very, 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 very long strings, yeah? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, but maybe Chinese characters? Yes, good, exactly what I was looking for actually. So other character sets, char other character sets can be readily accommodated within, uh, within you know, Unicode um, encodings. Um, uh, it might be, uh, might be East Asian um, uh, character sets, so Chinese would be a, a good one. Also maybe some that are left to right, instead of right to left, or right, right to left rather than left to right, uh, like Arabic scripts, I think, are. Um, uh, so, you know, a whole bunch of different ones. There's actually, if you look below 32, there are some that are like backspace character. Um, uh, and, you know, those in principle could be looked at, right? Um, now, I think you folks will appreciate when it comes to the difference between white box testing and, and or glass box testing, I prefer, and black box testing, these might we need to target these differently, right? Like, if, if you know the implementation, it might lead you to, to emphasize certain types of testing. You know, wait a minute, I mean, this thing has, um, uh, it, it's implemented in a way that, in an environment that there's no access to environment variables. It's implemented in this language, in this environment, and there's no way that any information on environment variables gets into there. 
compared to if it's implemented in a shell script where there's every bit of concern, right? So not that I wish you that. Um, never wish harm on my students. Um, but uh, you know, it, where, where expansion could take place. If you know something about um, the character encoding scheme, right? Um, you know, you're working on a Unicode compatible language and uh, you know that it, it shouldn't have trouble. You might test a little bit, but it's not going to concern you that much. If you know cross compilation is going on per Mesa's comments, um, then that might lead you to test platform compatibility. What things are risks uh, is often informed by knowing something about the implementation. You might, you might uh, for example, know that it's using a really intelligent algorithm to scan a string B and string A. For example, um, there's some very intelligent algorithms involving not needing to look further than you have to. And it kind of advances by the right number of characters. When you look here, you know it also rules out it being you know, just uh, one off to either side or something like that. You, you can reason about the strings being searched for and say, uh, you know, given how far I've looked already, this rules it out not only for the position I'm searching, but for nearby positions. And you can kind of jump forward and jump forward. Um, who's teaching 360 these days? Uh, is it, uh, is anyone in 360 this term? Uh, Dr. Mondale. Dr. Mondale? Yeah. Who was teaching it when most of you took it? When did, you, when did the others take it? Last year? Mark Kyle. Mark Kyle, yeah. So um, I don't know if they spoke with you about these things at all, but you know, string matching algorithms, which are, they, they're a lot more intelligent than just dumbly looking each position and kind of saying, is the string there? Um, does it start there? No. Does it start there? No. Does it start there? You can do much better than that. Um, and you can do better that by taking advantage of the um, sort of the structure of the thing being searched for. So, um, so in short, well, Glassbox, Glassbox tests will often end up testing in intelligent ways given the possible vulnerabilities or mistakes that are made in those algorithms. Um, they know how it's being searched for, so they'll they'll test, you know, is that underlying binary search working or is it off by one? Black box are often more like, I don't know what's going on there, but maybe it's got some weird results for Arabic characters or for, you know, string interpolation or, or uh, substitution of, of variables from the system as was suggested or backspace characters, um, which might be ruled out based on certain, uh, you know, implementation knowledge. Okay, so in general, you know, what we test for depends on our sense of risk. And there's not a lot of, we have limited time for testing. We can't test everything, no way. We have to prioritize our testing. What things are real, likely to be real vulnerabilities and what things are very unlikely. And put our efforts into the things that are more likely to be real vulnerabilities. So knowledge of how it's implemented will also often inform that a lot. Does that make sense? Anyone else want to share one or two interesting things? Or? Okay, we'll, we'll go on. Um, so we talked about this perspective of, of, of black boxes and structural or, or, or glass box testing. Um, and last time we noted some of the tools that we put into place that were illustrated here. Camille's example of searching for an empty string is a great example of a boundary value sort of thing. It's not a value, it's not a it's not a numeric value, but it's a string value that's kind of, um, you know, on the edge of that distribution, so to speak. Okay, um, and uh, there are times where we'll engage in oh, uh, random testing. Okay, the deal is I don't have recording going on from this um, uh, this uh, other machine, and as a result, I. Uh, I s have to record from my machine and um, just follow along the lecture. And I realized, oh my gosh, um, I have to transfer. I transferred the wrong file. It's, we're not going to probably get to these slides till next time. So I will copy over the correct one and, oh, no, it's there. So 
I guess I had both on there. Okay, well, that's not a bad thing. I just copied one to there, sorry. Okay, so today we're gonna to be talking further about some of these tools that we use in the context of, uh, of testing. So boundary values and uh, equivalence classes were two of the key tools uh, which we uh, talked about last time and indeed which were illustrated in your comments. Now we're going to be, yeah, sure. Um, uh, now we're going to be talking about some tools that uh, supplant those with or add to those, okay? Um, so uh, there's a tool known as a decision table, which basically characterizes the different possibilities for, for what's, what can happen, okay? And the idea here is that if you think about a web form, for example, um, and you have you know different drop downs here, or different edit boxes, um, and maybe check boxes, right? Um, or if you have a function which takes in you know several several arguments, is denoted by these formal parameters. Um, there are times where it's useful to ask what are the possible values of A, what are the possible values of B, what are the possible values of C in isolation, and, and reason about picking extreme values for each, and reason about picking combinations of each. And we'll talk about um, some ways that if these, if these three are independent, or essentially independent, we might pick combinations of them without picking all possible combinations. So there are times we do this. But there are other times where the choices of A influence what's possible for B. So maybe this is, you know, the, the province. And maybe this is the city within the province or something like that. And one implies something about, uh, about the other. Or maybe in a web form, you know, if you, if you tick this checkbox, um, or you check this tick box, choose your, your uh, pick your poison, um, these things are enabled or not, or one is enabled or the other is enabled, right? There are times where the inputs are structured. There's a, there's a relationship between them that's not merely one of independence. And a, and a decision tree can often um, capture some components like that in a hierarchical fashion. Um, uh, and other times it, it captures regular structure. This one that we're capturing here happens to be fairly regular. You have a um, number of claims that have been submitted for previously by this driver. This is for a, a driver um, for insurance, uh, insurance claim. So in other words, uh, someone's in an accident and, uh, and they need to, they're applying to be compensated for their um, damages. And this is telling us how to handle, um, to adjudicate these results. So if they've previously had no zero claims, I mean, you know, zero, zero claims, no previous claims, we'll handle it one way. If they've had one previous claim, we'll handle it different ways. Um, if they've had five or more, we're not gonna pay them previously. But two to four will will apply different uh, schedule of of uh, premium changes. So so we'll increase their premium by a certain amount, reflecting their risk. This is the the idea. Okay, and so this can be encoded, for example, in a decision tree. I would note that maybe in some in some cases these might be different. Maybe here it's thirty years old or younger, and thirty or older than thirty, or something like this. Thirty one and older. In which case, you could still capture it in a decision tree nicely. It would just be the branches here would be different for some of these, these nodes here. And this can summarize sort of what the salient, okay, I'm still going back and forth between these. This will summarize what the salient rules are in these cases, right? Um, uh, in this case, it's particularly uh, 
simple rubric where for those who are older, there's a lower, uh, a lower increase to their premium. In fact, half the other, the other increase. Um, but there's some differences in like how we, how we interact with them. Do we send a warning letter? Is there no letter applied, etc. Okay. So this is a way of sort of summarizing the possibilities within a decision tree. And one thing is that we could test, for example, well, how would you use this in testing? If you had a decision tree like this, how might you use this? Or equally much so if you want to summarize it in this form, which isn't that natural for certain cases. Like, oh, sorry. This is, this is really eerie. Um, here, there are cases where we, we could summarize it in a decision tree. We can't characterize it here because the decision tree might have special things considered if it's two to four that aren't considered here. And so they're not put into the table. They don't apply in all cases. They only apply for this case. And we can easily incorporate that in a decision tree. So if you had a decision tree like this one, which is fairly structured, how, wow, this is, this is really uh, freaky. Um, how would you, how would you use this to test? What's the obvious thing? Yeah. Each well, one could be a test case. Yeah, each is a test case. So look, you want to you want to at least test one of these, right? If if you haven't tested at least one case for each of these, how can you say with a straight face that this has been tested? And I include this cancel case here. Right? You want you want to test? Does the system work when we cancel? Does it trigger correctly a cancellation of their uh, insurance policy from this company, um, from this insur auto insurance company, when they have five or more claims? The insurance company might have a strong interest in making sure that this business rule is captured because these are some of the most problematic drivers right, in its policy. And they want to have this tested. You want to have each of these tested. And so you use that to drive a structured set of test cases. And you can say that in this case, perhaps it hasn't been, it hasn't been exhaustively tested if you have one of these, but if you haven't done it, it's hard to even pass the red face test, right? Um, how can you stand in front of someone who's, you know, the uh, uh, manager of this insurance company and say, yeah, we've tested this well if you haven't tested each of these cases. Because you, you don't know. I mean, maybe your system will issue a letter in this case here with, you know, 26 or older, one previous claim, when it should. Um, so, so it's kind of incumbent upon you to test at least one case. Now, is that exhaustively tested? If, if I do one for each of these cases, have I exhaustively tested that? No. For example, Maybe I pick, you know, the driver is 18 years old, right, to test this case. But, and maybe I pick the driver 28 years old to test this case. But I haven't yet made sure that there are, you know, that 25 is handled with this one and 26 with that one, right? There's additional tests we might do within each of these categories for boundary values, right? But by the same principle of equivalence classes, we want at least one of these for each. Does that make sense? At least one for each. Um, yeah. So um, boundary values are often dealing with off by ones. Oh. Um, off by one errors um, are often associated with boundaries, um, and boundary between equivalence classes is common. And these two really feed off each other. So look, equivalence classes. Um, uh, often delineate broad sets of inputs that are handled similarly. So you, maybe you have you know, negative numbers for your square root, right? And then you have positive numbers. And the boundaries are the boundaries between them, those equivalence classes. It's things like minus 1, 0, and maybe 1. You just want to make sure those are, those are handled, because maybe you have an off by 1 or something. Right? Um, and similarly with, you know, with strings or, or what have you, right? OK. Um, and generally, as yeah, was noted last time, um, you want to you probe around the boundary. You don't want to purely do the boundary value, because the whole point is that 
people might be off base about where the boundary is or, or thinking about the boundary. So you want to do, you know, the minimum and the minimum minus one and the maximum and the maximum plus one at the least to make sure, yeah, each is handled in, its, in the logic appropriate for each side. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to ask you to uh, undertake another exercise here. Um, uh, because time is limited um, and there's a bunch of frobbing going on, maybe at the moment I will ask you to focus on um, this, this next date function. Okay? So, uh, this is again wild. Um, next date. So you have, um, you have a function which specifies um, a date. And you can assume that date can give you. It doesn't have to be provided separately, but you can assume it can give you the day, month, and year. Right? Um, uh, Java used to do this with uh, the date object. Um, but that object has a lot of vulnerabilities. Most notably, it's mutable. And more recent versions of Java have had much better supports for calendar-based based dates. Um, dates, and I think it's with a calendar uh, abstraction. In any case, suppose you, you give it something that indicates the date. And you want to ask, what's the next date, and see if it operates correctly. Give me some cases that you might test that would would be good places to look for problems and good places to check that it's working properly. Yeah. Um, uh, so Mason. Yeah. Good. Good. So uh, logic associated with every four year leap years, right? So I, I like that, Mesa. Okay, that's that's interesting. Um, I trying to think if that would affect the next date. Uh, it could certainly affect the next hour, or, or yeah, what is what is the next hour? Because if you hit it at the magic witching hour, right? Um, like next hour is like would normally be one a.m., but it's actually um, switched. So. So, you know, if you fall back or leap forward, it's off by one of those. So, so that, that's actually a really nice idea for hours. I don't know that it comes into the date side, um, but, um, but I, I, like your, I like your point of critical points. Will? Good. So December 31st would be a great one. Last one of, of each month is, uh, is good, so you make sure it goes to next month. And, of course, what that needs to reflect is the months are of different lengths, right? Um, and, and so you're ensuring that, uh, you know, it goes, it goes correctly to the next day. So that's good, but how about, how about a variant on that idea? So that's a very good idea. I'm, I'm, I'm completely for it. But it brings up another set of related cases that's actually, it's, it's very closely related to what you said. Yeah, Will. Try the 31st of a month that doesn't have 31st. Good, good. And try maybe the date before the last real day of that month and see does it give you the next real day or does it prematurely go into the next one, right? Um, you, you might argue one will suggest the other and I don't. So in other words, if it's, broken that when you say the last day of this month and you ask the next day if it if it gives you the first of the next month you may argue well if that would imply that if I ask for the next to last day it won't give me that but no you want to look you want to look because bugs happen in, in code right so those are uh, those are excellent um, other other ideas yeah Lisa. Okay. Um, that's okay. Yeah. If this is specified via 
strings or something like that, sure. If you're giving it a date object, um, and this bears at the last, last comment as well, if you're giving it a date object, a date object that's legit, that's already been created, you're giving it a legit date, some of the ideas of saying, well, you know, it is, you know, April 31st, kind of, they're hard to realize because you can't create it in the first place, perhaps. But um, there may be some systems you can. If it's a string, that would be a, a, a good idea. And that would get us into testing strings. But the truth is, for a lot of our systems, where we're operating with type languages or where we're operating with uh, data structures that are built up for us by a library externally, you know, we have limited flexibility and, um, and specify certain types of weirdness. You know, if there's a... There's a function which depends on ints being given, an int being given for its first argument. You can't give it a string. I mean, the compiler will say, no, um, you know, you can't, can't do that. Um, uh, it, it, won't, it won't allow that. It will be blocked uh, by, a, by a compiler. So, um, so these are good. I, I like, uh, like what you're, you're thinking here. Um, there's some others too. Um, I mentioned, so Mason, I think it was, who mentioned every four years. But there's also, I don't know if you know, according to the Julian calendar, I guess it is, or whatever, um, every 100 years, there's a skip of what would be normally uh, uh, a leap year, I think it is. Um, either that or there's an extra. I think it's a skip of one. And every 400 years, there's a, there's a violation of that rule. And so, you know, can, this can get into some very specific tests um, uh, to, to reflect the fact. I think it's because the, the day is actually, the year is actually 365.2, two, or 2524, um, uh, or something like that. And so every 400 years, it's an exception, and every 100 years, and every four years, et cetera. Anyway. Um, so those are good, and it should get you thinking about like what are some good things to check. Um, you might check the first day of every month to make sure the second day is given properly, right? Very likely to be so, but greater chance that that's off than you know going from the 14th to the 15th, something like that. Okay, okay. How about substring? Um, I want you to think about this for for a little bit. I'll give you, you know, a minute or two if you want to talk with someone about it. Substring. Okay, so the idea here is we give a string and we specify an index into that string. Okay, um, where that index, we specify a starting index, say it's zero based, I'm deliberately understating this, zero based and, um, and end is Deliberately zero is, is zero based. Okay, um, and so those specify the indices um, that we want to include in the substring. So, so you know, if we have a substring, uh, uh, you know, foo, right, and we extract uh, and we ask start at index zero and end at index one, it will give me back. Foo, or foe, right? right? Start at zero, and the last one is one. It'll give me that. If I do foo, and I, I do one and two, yeah, let's do something better than that. Let's do uh, zero and two. What will it give me back? Foo, it'll give me back foo, right? If I do one and two, it'll give me back. Um, okay, so think about this. Take, a, take two minutes. Think about this. Maybe talk to people around you. Um, what are some good things to try for this? If you wanted to test this thing, suppose I give you an implementation, black box. You can't see my implementation. And I tell you, it has both. Or it has at least one bug in it. Find it. Give me some tests that will help rule out where that bug could live. Okay? So talk for two minutes. 
Okay, and and then we'll uh, we'll start up. folks uh, have given it some thought okay so let's let's uh, suggest some some good things to test okay um, so give me some that you think would be promising avenues for testing here yes Nisa. Nisa. You know, in that case, uh, uh, yeah, so I guess the question there would be, if you gave something as an int, which is, in fact, greater than the max int, how is it going to be handled? So it can be treated as a negative or something along those lines? But there's a question also in some languages that's going to be handled uh, well, you could calculate it, and so it wouldn't be discovered by the compiler you're doing that. Um, uh, it gets into issues of encoding of integers, which are a little bit less for testing this thing, but it's an, it's an interesting idea, and, and it gets into buffer overflow issues, um, too. 
I, I'm not sure it would be super useful for showing problems with the function. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not utterly convinced. I'll think about that more. So yeah, Will. Give it something like backslash n below, and then try on the first character, and see if it gives you backslash, if it, if it gives you backslash n, or if it gives you h. Yeah, good. OK. So, so I like that, uh, the first character, right? Um, and, um, and you want to confirm that it operates correctly. Notice I, I waved my hands for this. I didn't even provide you a specification, so it's loosey-goosey, but presumably it should provide backslash, right? Interpret it literally, Sam. Uh, the end is before the beginning. Good. I love it. I love it. Once again, I didn't specify what it should do, but what you would expect would be that it would it would not it would not be um, acceptable. So maybe it would it would either be ruled out by the specification. If there's no specification given, you'd expect an error message or error, you know, an exception to be thrown or um, some other indication that this is illegitimate, returns null or, or something, right? But this is part of the point of thinking through tests. I'm emphasizing TDD, and part of the reason for thinking these things through is, you know, what do we need to reflect in the code, but also what do we need to reflect in the specification that I'm going to be looking through for in all your code bases? You know, saying this is what this function does, or this is what the job of this class is, this is what its preconditions, postconditions are. So it helps us think those things through. So you're absolutely right, and it, it brings up a whole bunch of test cases um, for that, right? This whole family of test cases where you could add, you know, foo, and you have to start be greater than the the the, the, fin the start be greater than the uh, the end, right? And what does it do? You know, you would expect this to be an error of some sort, right? Or to be otherwise ruled out by the specification, saying you're not allowed to do this. I don't take any responsibility if you give this to me. Um, what you wouldn't expect this to do is to give you oof, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oof, that would be bad, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, others. Yeah. Uh, maybe starter n larger than length of the string? Yeah, exactly. Um, so starter n is, exceeds the length of the string. So we might have something like foo, <laughs> and we have three, right? Because it's zero based. Yeah. And, um, and maybe we do three, three, right? Um, and we make sure that, that that's ruled out, right? Awesome. Yeah. Um, others? Yeah. So ne negative index. Uh, negative index, right. Exactly. So foo, and we give a minus one, and you know, minus one, right? Um, it should give an error, right? So these things should be within bounds on the upper side. So it's an interesting thing, right? I, I just want to draw attention to the fact that if you're writing a specification for this, what's the upper bound of, of the start? What's the lower bound of the start? What's the minimum possible value start to be? Zero. Zero. What's the maximum value the end should be? Bigger than the start and lower than the Okay, well. Uh, I said, what's the maximum value it could have? The, the length minus one, right? Very importantly, because it's you're counting from zero. Um, okay, but Kevin's alluding to the fact that it's not that you know that that start is between zero and the length minus one, and end is between zero and length minus one alone in isolation, because they depend they actually have to maintain an invariant to each other, right? N has to be greater than or equal to, to start, right? So it would seem there's a question of, going back to Camille's suggestion earlier, what if you have an empty string? You know, a string that's totally empty. Um, should you allow start greater than end? Because you're not 
Going to get anything out of it? Well, again, that's something you would expect to see fleshed out in the sense that the specification should be written to make it clear, for example, is it a high bond rule that start is less than or equal to n? I would hope so, but someone could say, well, look, if it doesn't matter, if it's, you're never going to use start or n, it can be anything you want as long as the string is empty, right? As long as it's an empty string. So again, you'd expect to see this in a specification, right? Okay, um, how about some additional ones? Any? Any anyone else have, have some ideas here? Emojis. Sorry, sorry? Emojis. Good, good, yeah, you can give all sorts of non-ASCII characters or characters that can be interpreted as cursor movement. Um, absolutely, that, those would be be, be good characters uh, to, to try. And actually, it gets into, I'll be with you just a sec, Sam. It gets into the point that, um, so when I was a young man, and you folks weren't born, and the earth was still cooling. Um, uh, yeah, I know. You, you think when I was young, all we had is ones and zeros. But you should have seen it when Mark Kyle was young. All he had is zeros. Um, <laughs> so, um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, binary arithmetic was unary arithmetic. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, um, so, uh, so, so when I was young, character meant it was defined as one byte. One byte. One byte was one character in C. And at some point, professional software companies realized we got to get our act together because we're losing a large part of the world, world market if we can't support a broader set of language sets, right? Um, we have to support. You know, even in Canada, you have to support, you know, a whole bunch of, of accented characters, et cetera, outside the normal ASCII range. But then you've got these whole world of different scripts and so on from around the world. And we can't crush those in as much as we'd like to into, you know, 256 possibilities. And so then character was defined as being more than one byte, but there was a whole lot of code that assumed character was one byte. And there was a tumultuous period where that code base had tons of errors because you switch to multi-byte characters without the underlying logic changing. And the underlying logic might be hard-coded in values or what have you. Yes, OK. OK, so, so the point is, um, with emojis or with you know foreign character sets or what have you, um, you've got to wonder if you start is that a character index or a byte index? You hope it's character, right? Um, and you're trusting it's character. But if this is written in low level C on a machine which where you know it's not dealing with those sort of character sets, um, or you're using an older library. A C library, which are still around, the same C libraries that I grew up using, um, you know, are still still around. The C standard library and so on. Um, you can make a mistake of defining things in a way that these are actually byte indices, um, and where it's still one byte per character. So, so these are things to check for. It's a, it's a good reason that. If not emojis, then other, you know, other character sets. You really want to uh, to test. Any others? Any other ideas for testing? So you start to see some of these points about, like the the rules for these different arguments A, B, and C are not. You can't consider each in isolation. It's not that A could be anything between 0 and length minus 1, and B can be anything between 0 and length minus 1. No, if you give A that's a certain value, it implies certain things about B. Or actually, here we're talking B and C okay, for, the, for the start and end. Right? And in fact, A 
implies things about BNC's legitimate ranges. And I expect those things to be captured in specifications. Um, and they get into very practical issues of, is it OK to pass whatever for BNC if I pass it a null? Or I pass it an empty string, right? Um, is the semantics well defined? Um, uh, you know, if these are not, not in some range. After all, what would the range be if you pass it an empty string? Um, does it make even sense to say the start is zero and the, and the end is zero? Because the end needs to be between, and the start needs to be between, of each of these, zero and length minus one. And if you're passing a blank, length minus one is what? Speak on, youths. <laughs> minus one. So is, you know, if you give it a blank, what are legitimate values for these? Think about it naively. These are between zero and length minus one, which suggests there's, there's not a legitimate value to specify, right? So, so you have to you have to think about you know what, how how are how are those things defined for these cases where, for example, this is a corner corner case. It's a it's you know an empty string. Um, Anyway, things to, uh, to think about there, but at a very practical level, this gets into testing. These are a whole swag of test cases that you could confirm that it works correctly, that it doesn't work in a set of test cases. This is extremely important. You, you test that it, it correctly indicates an error when there's not, when, when there is one. Um, that it doesn't just blithely return whatever, um, uh, you know, at those times. Um, and, and you test that it's, it's operating properly. There's a set of invariants, too. Like, you could try this with random generation. Give me a random test that you could do. It's pretty easy. Then you could check that it's operating properly and run potentially, you know, tens of thousands of these tests easily within the course of a second. Yeah, Mason. Generate a random character or a random string. You know the length of it, and then you generate the first value between zero and the end, and then the end being uh, the first, the B and the end minus one. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. And But what do you compare it to? The result, so you get a result back, and what do you compare it to? What do you expect it to be? So, so you could do that. You, you need a way of computing what the true value should be. But one thing you could always do is you could generate, just on your idea, very essentially almost the same idea, Mason. You could generate a random string. You could generate you know, values B and C, which are identical. They're both one value, and that is you know, a value randomly drawn between 0 and the length of the string minus 1. Hmm? And that should always give you a string of what length back? One, right? Should always give you a, a string of length one back. And, and that, would, that would be a, you know, a random string that, that could be checked. If you had a way of peeking what the first character is, you could always make sure, you know, if you give it zero, you get, you get the first character back. And if you give it the last one, you get the last character back. And certainly you want to check the extremes where you give it some values that are at the edge of each of these cases, the first and last, because those are the boundaries, and, and check that, right? I hope this is getting you to think about concrete test cases. We write specific test cases. We give specific things that are often motivated by a certain set of problems in our reasoning or a certain lack of clarity in the specification, certain you know, concerns about the design, and they force us to think about the implementation. That's why we do them before developing, if possible, um, and I will be requiring that. But it also forces us to think about the specification, and it gives us a bunch of things to test, which give bugs less room to hide, right? Is this exhaustive? No, it's not exhaustive, but 
it would probably find a fair number of bugs out there if there was some broken thing with the code. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's let's continue on. Um, okay, so uh, there's some additional important components here. So I've noted that often we don't have independent um, independent fields or inputs, more generally inputs, right? Um, if we do, and in some sense the logical reasoning is simpler, we're independent of each other, we can think about each constellation, but the number of possibilities rises really quickly. And there are times where we need to test that it's working with different combinations of those inputs. And we have ways that have been created of dealing with combinations of inputs in ways that allow us to test a large number of intelligently chosen combinations without testing all possible combinations. Because I want to emphasize, all possible combinations rises geometrically, right? Suppose that, suppose that each of n, so we have a, a set of drop downs. We have five drop downs on the page. And each of them have 10 possibilities. How many different combinations do we have? Not permutation, combinations. How many different ones? Well, if they're independent, what, what is it? Suppose we have we have one. How many different possibilities? It is ten possibilities, so we have ten. How if we have two? They're independent, so hundred. How if we have three? Thousand. Ten to the n. So five, hundred thousand. Right. So. This may not seem overwhelming if it's values to plug into a function that's something like Sterling. You could run 100,000 within you know, a second, probably, on today's processors. But if these are different configurations on your machine of browsers and media players and plugins for those browsers to support Grammarly or support you know, a reports manager or support um, some sort of audiovisual uh, cap streaming capabilities for your systems or what have you. That becomes really onerous because it might involve, you know, manual configuration of systems that have these characteristics to test to make sure it's operating. You know, or scripts that have to call up IE4 and IE5 and IE6 and Edge and Chrome you know, version, whatever, and, and Firefox, and these different combinations. So it's, it's quite expensive. So when we have these combinational blow-ups, excuse me, these combinatorial blow-ups, um, there's many cases where we don't have the luxury of examining all possibilities, because soon that number becomes too high. You know, I think they estimate the number of uh, this was early in my life. I remember hearing the number of atoms in the universe is, 10, is, is estimated to be 10 to the 80 or something like that. <laughs> so if you have 80 fields in your forms, you know, you'd have to run a test for each atom in the universe or something like that. I think it was 10 to the 83 or something. Of course, that was a while ago. Um, okay. Um, so the idea behind orthogonal rays is that we can't test all combinations sometimes, but in a lot fewer possibilities, a lot fewer inputs, we can test all pairs. Okay. So imagine that you have within, let's say, a form. A, B, C. Okay. So maybe these are drop downs, right? And if they're selecting different services or different configurations of your system, some heavyweight thing to, to specify. Um, ideally, 
variable one, this is, or we'll call it, we'll call it one, and it has possibilities A, B, C, etc. There's variable two, it has possibilities I, J, K, L, M, and there's, poss there's possibility three, or there's input three, which is uh, B, W, X, Y, Z, okay? Um, if I consider those, each of those has five possibilities, right? So how many possibilities would there be combinatorially? Set of all possible combinations. If this is five, this is five, and this is five, we have what? Yeah, 125, five to the three. Okay? And, and if that's prohibitive, or if that takes too long, or if it requires you know, UI-based testing or manual configuration for each of these, um, rather than pulling a NIDR in S386 with the Oculus, um, you might want to test fewer combinations, but still be intelligent. And the idea of intelligent here is you're not going to test all possibilities of variable one, variable two, variable three, or of each of these drop downs. What you're going to test is any pair. Okay? So there's guaranteed to be, for any pairing of what you choose from one and two, some test case that exercises that. And for any combination between two and three, there's going to be some test case that is that combination each of those 25 combinations. And for any test case between one and three, there's going to be some case that has those. So any pairs of values for one and two, one and three, and two and three is going to be tested. It's just not all possible combinations. You know, um, maybe this particular pairing of one and two only is, occurs in the context of a single value of, of, of number three. And all possible pairings of one and three maybe only occur in the context of a single value of possibility two. So this is the idea behind it, orthogonal array. And it's, it's very um, feasible. I mean, it's, it's feasible, it's doable, there's algorithms to calculate it, um, and, and it can be very useful, particularly if you're dealing with you know, manual configurations of things, okay? Um, and it turns out that this has a massive reduction in number of possibilities associated with it. So you go from something like 36 possibilities to 9, or you go from a rather large number of possibilities uh, involving things that have 10, and other ones that have uh, uh, you know, 4 of them that have 10 possibilities, 7 that have uh, uh, 4 of them that have, have 7 possibilities, etc., to 144. 10 to the 15th to 199. Um, in short, you get orders and orders of magnitude decrease in the number of test cases you run. But you're doing so in a way that's intelligent in the sense that you're still testing exhaustively all possible combinations of values of any two. Now, why is this intelligent? I mean, why is it better to to reduce this to these 199 than an arbitrary chosen set of 199. The Greek chords remain silent yet, but hope springs eternal, like the springs on Mount Erebus. Um, yes? So the likelihood within that big number of those is being the exact same output? Yeah, yeah. Because often, ladies and gentlemen, I think Mason was specifying that if I can unpack that a bit. Errors, errors often occur of certain sorts. We saw it earlier, right? Prioritizing these these things we would test in a, a short sort of length function or the count instances function. They don't come about randomly. They come about because of certain types of faulty reasoning, et cetera, certain types of mistakes. And one of the places they come up a lot when you have combinations of things is there's incompatibility between pairs. Like, like there's, maybe there's a problem. Maybe you, you choose your browser, 
and you choose your plugin, uh, and you choose your operating system. Okay? So I can do Chrome on Mac with this type of plugin for Grammarly, or I could do, um, or, or this type of reference manager plugin um, for, for managing references, uh, bibliographical references. Or I could do, you know, Windows and Chrome and that. Or I could do Windows and Firefox and that. Or I could do Windows and Edge and that, or whatever, right? Um, often if there's a problem, it's a compatibility between two things. You can get cases where, like, this only is a problem on Edge on Mac. I don't know if Edge exists on Mac, but on Edge, you know, or, or Chrome on Mac. With, um, uh, with this particular plugin. But very commonly, it's an incompatibility of two of them rather than all three of them. So the problem is brought out. As long as you have those two, you will find them. Hmm? There's a lot of things in life. It's, it's compatibility between two things. It doesn't require three things. It's even true of people. Um, uh, so, so ladies and gentlemen, this algorithm, the, the orthogonal array, guarantees that you test pairwise compatibility. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So you're testing pairwise, and the chances are very high that bugs have, are issues with pairwise compatibility rather than only manifesting when you have these three possible combinations. And frankly, the number of people that will be inconvenienced by bugs that are pairwise is much greater than the number that will be inconvenienced by only, you know, the small number that have all three a certain way together. So you're finding the high risks for user inconvenience because large user segments might have a given pair of these. You know, they're using Chrome on Mac or they're using Firefox and Windows, or they're using Linux and, and you know, uh, uh, window, uh, Linux and, and uh, Chrome, or Chromium. Uh, so, so in short, this is a high chance of, this boils it down to, distills it down to a set that has all possible compatibility issues between pairs without requiring exhaustively examining all possible combinations. They're very practical. There, there are tools to generate these things. I put down a URL, but this is a couple of years old, and I don't know that it's still there, but you can find orthogonal array generators as part of statistical packages, etc., and they will just generate for you. Say, I want to test these things, uh, and it will generate, you know, uh, a set of um, an orthogonal array for, for those items. And it's a lot more efficient than doing all possible combinations. Think about, think about the timeline project, right? I want to I have combinations of, of uh, magnitude data and log scaled axes or not, and I want to be able to you know, to, to turn them on or off or what have you and, and uh, uh, have different different levels of zooming, and uh, I'd like to be able to test that those things work on a pairwise basis. Okay, um, there are cases. Well, I mentioned one earlier where we engage in what's called conformational random testing. Okay, and this testing basically is generating random numbers where we can confirm that the answer matches expectations. So I gave one of these earlier, right? Um, you're, you're taking this, you're taking start and ends equal to each other, and you're verifying the length is one. That's a particularly trivial example. Or you're, you're generating random strings, and you're testing that the first character is equal to the first character, or to the character at zero, zero is equal to the very first character of that string, something along those lines. Another thing is you have square root, right? Square root is something that's, that's reasonably um, uh, computationally intensive to perform, but it's inverse. Well, what about it's inverse by contrast? So if, if you have a square root, 
How does performing a square root compare with performing a square root? Which is easier? Which involves more bookkeeping and work? Square root. Square root. If you give me a square root, if I say, compute for me the square root of x, and it computes uh, what's allegedly square root of x, what can I do really easily? I can, I'm going to say, fill in the blank. I can fill in the blank then. Yeah, I square it. I just compare it to the virtual number I get, right? It's trivial. Really easy to do, and I can check it works. Or suppose I'm trying to get an airline routing between city A, city B on certain days. Um, give me a route, right? Puts me through Calgary to Seattle. I can verify that the route it gives me starts in Saskatoon on the right day. It goes to Seattle on that same day, and it's contiguous. If there's places in between the success of legs, you know, there's a leg that ends there, and that next leg starts there, right? Um, and the timing of the departure for the next leg is after when I arrive by a certain minimum number of minutes. It's, it's really easy something to check. That doesn't mean that this is the best route, but at least it rules out that it's totally broken, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you might choose that it's better than a naive route to that, to that same place, right? Um, uh, another thing you can do in contact with assertions is if you have a really clever algorithm, maybe it's for string searching, maybe it's for route optimization for buses, maybe it's, you know, graph traversal, um, algorithm or what have you. One thing that's often really easy to do is um, create a brute force version of that. There's a whole class of problems in computer science. Problems with, with which I hope most people here have enjoyed acquaintance, the pleasure of acquaintance. Um, where um, with that problem, it's really easy to create a kind of naive algorithm, a brute force algorithm for doing it. It's, it can be done in a few lines sometimes. You know, multiple loops or something like that. But it's very expensive, right? By contrast, doing it intelligently is much faster, but it's much trickier. So the idea here is you compare the results with your brute force algorithm in testing against the clever one. Mm -hmm. And you make sure they're the same. Maybe you even have an assertion that does that at runtime while you're running the system. But of course, the assertion gets stripped out when you ship it, when you go live, when it's deployed. And so there, it's actually testing is the answer I get to this really clever algorithm, the same as I get through the brute force algorithm. You're confident if it's the same every time, yeah, you've got a good algorithm. Um, but the user doesn't go to the penalty. It's just, it, it's, a, it's an easy thing to, to double check. Think about that. Think about that. Okay? Um, that's all we have time for today. Thanks very much. And I want to remind people that in this class, I routinely, after each lecture, hold office hours. I've enjoyed. Um, seeing many of you in my office, but there's many I've not yet uh, seen, and uh, I would like to do so. Okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah, but you came in after the group meeting, so that's too late. You picked these up before that. So. Yeah, you have to be here for the group meeting. To, to, sorry? No, when I came in, the group meeting was finished. I mean, by the time you came in, the group meeting was done. So I'm not going to accept that. All of these requirements are super good. Super good. Like, you said you get CC frames from you have like a. Yeah, you think like sometimes when you know about the implementation, it can help you write tests, right? Yeah. But with, with TDD, you want to write tests before you implement. Yeah. So is it all right to write more unit tests after? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, and, and generally you will. 
Um, uh, you know, sometimes the starting unit tests are are written in a way that's um, you know getting you going and your thinking and so on. But like the, the very act of writing the code and then sometimes having peer review of it gives you a lot of additional ideas for tests. Okay. And so then you write a lot more tests. You know, and in general, yeah, you want to support writing a lot of tests after. The key is to write at least some. Get you thinking about some beforehand. Yeah, yeah. So that um, you know you can um, think about the implementation. You think about the implementation. You think about the specification. Like what needs to be specified. Maybe it's not really defined what this should be, and you need to talk with these. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so those are good things to be thinking about before you write code. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, afterwards. You want to write probably a lot more tests from the right there. there. And the testers part of the team, like the people writing the tests in GED, often they're the developers. But the testers also need to contribute tests. Yeah, they need to contribute tests. Second layer. So, so yeah, please, uh, please be encouraged to write tests after. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Damn. Um. Uh, you know, I, I welcome meeting stu with any students here is the priority, but um, uh, if there's uh, not high demand for that, I might uh, ask for a bit of your time, TA time, um, to sort of talk a little bit more about, uh, about the class. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. Yes. So, so that might, but I mean, if that's MCC. 